Hey, how's it going everybody? My name is David Wood for TheBlendMode.com and today is Star Wars Day. Today I wanted to take a look at a very, very cool program that I was recently introduced to called Natron. Natron is a free open source node-based compositor. It's very cool. It's similar to how Nuke is designed to work. If you're familiar with node-based compositors, you understand that and stuff. But I wanted to show you how to make a basic lightsaber effect with the program. And it's not too different from how you would do it with After Effects using, you know, basic layers and masking and rotoscoping and keyframes. Uh, but nobody else has done this yet, and I really wanted to show you how to do at least the basic effect and also how to uh, mask over where the blade would be if it goes behind an object or something like that. So nothing too complicated. I'm still very new to the program, but I think you'll really enjoy what we're going to look at today. Let me show you exactly what we're going to be doing with this tutorial. Here's just a short example video of what the final result looks like. Just a short video to show you basic uh, keyframing and also uh, how to hide the blade when it goes behind a person. So uh, a little rough on the tracking there, that's okay. But uh, an initial you know, lightsaber turning on and then as it comes around behind my back, how to mask that out so it doesn't appear to go through me <laughs> and instead appears behind me. So that's what we're going to be learning about today. Um, in case you're not familiar with what a node-based compositor is, I drew up a basic chart of how you can kind of tell what a node-based compositor is that is different from a linear editing software like After Effects. And uh, this is a very rough, rough, uh, you know, mock-up here that I did just to show you the basic idea of it. On the left we have our traditional linear-based editing software. So in this case, you would have a background plate. Let's say you filmed a video and you wanted to add something to it. You wanted to add a fire element to it. And then you, you know, gave it some additional color correction and stuff like that. And then the camera would actually look like look at it. So it's sort of like the camera is looking down at a bunch of layers and you keep adding layers on top of it. In fact, there's a really great uh, layer-based versus node-based compositing article by Wolf Crow, which talks about the difference between them, and it likens layer-based compositing, like you would do with After Effects, to uh, making a lasagna, which I think is funny because I love lasagna, it's delicious, but like you make lasagna, you put layers and layers of pasta and cheese and pasta sauce together into one final meal that you then would bake. So the same thing with a layer-based compositor is it's layers over layers over layers till you get the final result. And it's got its pros and cons. One of the pros is that it looks like an editor that you would use for actually editing all the clips together. So if you were to work in Premiere, for example, you would have a timeline that would show you where all of your layers are, where a layer starts, where a layer stops. And that is a nice benefit if you want to just do, you know, a few little tweaks and stuff if you're not adding too much to an image. If you just want to add a couple different effects and then have it processed out into a final video, then a layer-based compositor is very simple to use. A node-based compositor, on the other hand, is a much more complex and intricate way of doing the same thing as a linear editor but it gives you a little more control over all of the elements that you bring together. Specifically, compositing is used traditionally for putting a bunch of 3D elements into a scene. So you would have your background plate that you shot, and then you would have multiple layers or different render passes from whatever 3D software you're using that you would then composite together to create the final image. So you could have like a base layer of say like a spaceship and then you would have a second pass which would show the shadows, you'd have a third pass that was highlights and so on and so forth. So a node-based compositor sounds like it might be a little bit trickier to use but in reality it's it's really not. And uh, let's go back to the chart that I have and show you exactly what I mean. So on the left like I said it's the linear editor. You've got the background and then you've got an element that you want to use, this fire element, that the blend mode is set on screen so that you can see the background. And then 
there is an adjustment layer on top, which if we follow the little arrows around, you can see this adjustment layer has both a contrast filter and a color correction filter. I just abbreviated that C because it was easier to do. The fire element, on the other hand, also has a glow filter on top of it. So all of those things to combine give us the final output or image that the camera sees. And it's going to go down through the layer. So layers are stacked on top of each other. And the top layer, obviously, is the first one the camera looks at. If we look at a node-based compositor, you can kind of look at this as, say, um, like a water, like a piping system for water. You have the initial source of water, and you have a destination you want it to go to. But in order to get it there, you have to set it through a certain set of pipes and channels to actually get to the final output. So here we have our background plate that is whatever footage we shot. And we want to get it to this output here. The output represents the camera. And the way that you would do this in a node-based compositor is you would load your background plate, then you would load whatever you know footage you want to put into that scene. So let's say you wanted to put this fire element into it. Then you would have to get the two of them to connect together. And it's kind of like mathematics that is a, very much what you would be doing with this. So let's say that in order to get these two connected, you can't just put these on top of each other like you would with a linear editor and set the blend mode on screen. You need what is called a merge node. And a merge node takes these elements and merges them together and lets you choose which one is the background, which one is on top, and what blending mode you're using to blend them together. So these two elements would then be merged into this node right here. And that's a very tiny brush. Let me bump the size up a little bit. There we go. Okay, so these two elements would then be merged together into this, which we could then directly pipe out from this merge node straight through to this output. But if we wanted to get all of the effects that we've added to our linear-based editor, we have to set things up a little bit differently. So we've got our background plate, we've got our fire element that we want, and our fire element has that glow on it that we see right here. Now, a node-based compositor is a really great way of seeing where all of the elements that you've added to a scene are. Because normally, in a traditional linear editor, all you know is that that's a fire layer. You don't know what's on it until you actually click on the layer and go into the effects and see what's there. A node compositor shows us the complete chain of events that are attached to that specific layer. So in this case, the fire layer, or this fire node, first is connected to a glow node that would give it a nice glow, and from that glow, then it merges with the merge node and the background plate. Now that might sound complicated, but it, like I said, it lets you see everything that you've done to change this fire layer in a nice, simple, organized manner. So let's say you've merged these elements together. You've got your fire element here, you've got your glow attached to the fire, which is then screened over the background plate with this merge node. Now, at this point, you're up to this level here. These elements here are done. But then you've got an adjustment layer on top. And this adjustment layer has both a, let's say, a contrast curve to really, you know, make the image pop, and then a basic color correction to remove, you know, let's say the scene that you shot, you didn't get the color correct, so it's maybe a little too green or a little too red. So you've got a color correction on top of that. So in order to do that in a node-based compositor, you could then add the appropriate nodes before the final output. So let's say we've got our fire and, and our background. They're done. The fire's got the glow. It's got the merge. And this right here is where we are between the adjustment layer and the element layer. So now we could add a contrast node after the merge node. 
which would be the same thing as adding an adjustment layer and then putting a contrast on that adjustment layer. Then after the contrast, then we put a color correction. And it's the same thing as if we added a color correction to that adjustment layer. But now we actually see them as separate entities instead of hiding them based on a layer. So if all of our elements like this are connected correctly, we've got our fire with our glow, which is merging with our background plate on screen mode. Then we've got a contrast and we've got our color correction. Then our final output is going to look exactly the same as our camera output that we have in a traditional linear editor. So that's the basic idea of how a node-based compositor works. Um, I'm not going to get any more technical than that because I'm still very new to it and I don't have all of the answers. So uh, I hope that at least explains it a little bit for you guys to be able to tell the difference. So now that you know the basic difference between a linear and a node-based compositor, let's actually take a look at Natron. Now the Natron website is natron.fr and as you can see it's free open source compositing software available for Mac, Windows, and Linux. Here we can see a screenshot of a very uh, what appears to be complex scene using Natron and you can see in here we've got a bunch of different little nodes that are all connected to each other and intertwined to make this very nice organic almost a tree shape which looks pretty cool and you can see like there's a comparison of these two shots um, this is probably what the original looked like and then once they added a bunch of stuff to it this is what the output is and here's an even better picture of it so like we see here there's a there's a source node, source node, source node. These two are merged into this, which is then merged with this node that has some sort of color correction in between where it's merged. And that pipeline goes down and then it goes into a bunch of other things. So once you actually get the hang of how this, uh, like this forking branch system works, it's actually not that complicated and it works pretty well. So, uh, like I said, the Natron homepage, natron.fr, and uh, you can go and download that and follow along with this a little bit better than if you just watch the tutorial. <laughs> Alright, so let's jump into Natron so I can show you how to create some basic lightsaber effects. So this is the Natron layout window. It's very similar to Nuke, if you've ever used Nuke before. I never have, so it was a little different uh, than what I thought it would be. But it's not too different from what you would see with After Effects. Um, the main difference is that all of the properties for the nodes and effects that you add to it are going to be on this side instead of over on this side, as After Effects tends to do. If you wanted to switch that around, you certainly can. You can move these windows around and reorganize it however you like. The basic setup worked fine for me. Now I'm not going to show you all of the features about navigating this window. There's already a fantastic tutorial for that that I will link to that you should definitely watch before you actually watch this one. Um, but some basic things is uh, with your scroll wheel down here, this is your node graph where all of your nodes will end up. And you can zoom in and out with your scroll wheel. And if you hold down your scroll wheel, you can click and drag and move around. So you can find things and just, you know, move around to see your nodes better. And uh, right now all we see is this viewer, which is basically the camera. And you can see that here. Over on the right is our project settings. And you, there's a bunch of different menu options and stuff. We're not going to uh, bother with any of those. We're just going to look in the basic settings. Um, down here we have a frame rate. And the frame rate for my video is not 24 frames a second. My frame rate is, let's see, mine is 29.97. That's close enough. There's like a zero and a zero and a three or something after that, but whatever. We're not gonna worry about getting it that correct. And up here is the output format. And um, for some reason, the footage that my camera films um, I think it's a camera setting, but mine does not film in 1920 by 1080. Instead, it films in uh, 1440 
by 1080. So when I import it in here, it's going to act a little glitchy, and I'm just going to have to correct that over here in the output format. Um, but um, this is really easy to do. There are a couple ways to bring your project in. The easiest is simply to find the file you want and click and drag it and drop it into the node graph here. Or you can right click and under image you have what's called a reader. And a reader is basically a way of importing a specific type of file. So in the reader you've got a raster image, you've got a Krita document, um, a PSD from like Photoshop, and then you've got this FFmpeg, which is a basic video importer. Uh, there's nothing super fancy about that. That's basically how you get all of your video files into it. So you could click on that and it will give you this window and say, all right, find us this file. And then you can go through and find exactly what you're looking for. I'm just going to uh, find my file, which is on my desktop, and, and drag it into here and drop it. Um, and delete this old one. So here's my footage node. This is my background. And we need to connect it to this viewer. So we'll select this one, click and drag up to it. Or if we have this selected, we can hit one on the keyboard and that'll bring it up too. So now this is connected. And now we need to set um, our video in and out points of just the area that we're going to edit for this video. So I already know that mine is uh, 300 at frame 300 to frame uh, 350. And this is your basic timeline window here that you can see. And you can click and drag. So you have a little bit of linear editing ability with this. But you don't actually have a linear setup through here like you normally would where you could see layer and layer and layer. Uh, this is where I want to do. Uh, this is where I want the video to start. So I can either click this button in this corner or I can use the keyboard shortcut Alt I. I'm just going to click on that. Now that's my video in point. And then on this, then I want to uh, go to frame 350. And I'm going to set an out point. And the button is over on this side. It's also Alt O. So now it's just between this. So what you see here is a little footage of me. Um, with a yardstick because I couldn't actually find a lightsaber in the house for some odd reason. And it's just a basic little flip around the hand and around the back and back like that. Um, it's just something real simple that we can animate real quickly so you can get a basic idea of how this effect looks. But that's, that's what it looks like right there. Alright, so we'll go back to the first frame. Alright, like I said, this for some reason my footage um, acts really weird and it messes up the aspect ratio of the effects if I don't change the output format from uh, the the 1440 by 1080 at the pixel ratio of 1.3333 that um, it auto detects I have to change that back to HD 1920 by 1080 alright so let's get started with making a lightsaber blade first uh, we can come down here into our node graph and if we right click, then we can go into image. And we have two options. There's either uh, we create what is called a constant, or we can create a solid. And there is a difference between the two of them. I don't remember exactly what makes a constant different from a solid. But since most of you guys are probably coming from After Effects, we're just going to create a solid so that we know just what we're talking about. So we create a solid and our properties window up here brings up the options for it and if we hit one on the keyboard it just looks like that it's just black there isn't any kind of actual like checkerboard pattern showing that there's an alpha um, oh maybe there is if check the viewer draws a checkerboard under the image instead of black so if I disable that no Hmm, I don't know. There's supposed to be an option here, but it doesn't seem to actually do anything um, to hide that. Or not even disconnecting that. Weird. Anyway, that's not important right now. This is uh, just a plain black layer 
or black solid rather, that uh, is going to be the background. So over on the side, we can just name this uh, Saber Background. We can pick a different color if we want. I'm just going to make this a gray. Uh, if we right click again, we're going to go into this draw menu and choose a roto. And this is very similar to if you make a rotoscope layer or a, hey look, there's our checkered background. It's the same as if you make a, a shape layer or a basic rotoscoping layer in After Effects. Uh, when it creates it, it gives us these tool options here that give a, let us uh, make paths and curves. And uh, if we left click and hold down, there's a couple different menu options underneath each of these. Uh, this menu allows you to add and remove points on an, an already existing curve. This option here, this gives us a choice between individual points which we create and an eclipse, eclipse, I always say eclipse, an ellipse, like if you want to make a vignette around your vignette. An ellipse, like you want to make a vignette around your photos to darken the edges and also a rectangle. So we're going to leave that on Bezier, Bezier, anyway. Yeah, a basic Bezier curve, and we're going to, going to go into here and just do four basic points, roughly in the shape of a lightsaber blade, and click back, and there we've got our basic points. That's cool. This is, like, I've never played with this option before. So there's our, this is, this right here in the background is transparent, and then this right here is our saber background. So it acts like a layer mask, which is kind of interesting because if you hover over the roto option, there is an actual choice to make a mask, which I don't know if you connect that to a separate roto layer, probably. I don't know. I haven't gotten too far into that. Um, but right now, it's just making a mask around that shape, and it's using the color from that image. So if we go into our Roto properties, this color slider does absolutely nothing. But if we go to the output and say, all right, ju besides just um, the alpha that we want, let's say we also want to have the red, green, and blue channels. So we click, click, and click. And now it's rendering all of those channels and also this layer here. It now has a color option. So if we wanted to say instead make this a green or a red or a blue. And let's see. Yes, I am doing that right. <laughs> Mostly. Like I said, I didn't even realize that this this clicker was here before. Um, right now it's it's just white with a transparent background. And that's not going to do us any good for what we need. So actually let's uh, rename this layer. This is going to be the Saber Blade. We'll create another solid. This one will actually be the background. Our Saber background. This one will be black. Uh, and what we need to do is we need to create a merge node, which we've already uh, got to look at from that example image that I made. So uh, we can right click and go under merge. And there's a couple different options. If you choose a merge node, then it gives you uh, the merge node and then it gives you a list of all the different blend modes that you can use from it. Or there's an option for merge with pre-selected blending modes added to it. So we can just go to merge, merges screen. And we can move this over here. And this is um, this is a little bit backwards than what you would think. Um, you have several different options. You have a B, you have A, you have A2, and then you can add masks. And once these are connected to different nodes, then more options can come up. So you can end up connecting, you know, like eight or nine different um, effects to this single merge node, if you so desire. And you can probably do a lot more, but then it would just look cluttered. And B is for your background, which is kind of uh, goofy, I think, just because of the fact that it's over here on this side. So uh, 
let's say this saber background, which is just a black solid, is over here. We want that to be our B. So click the B and drag over there. Now this is our background. And then we need to select the A. Let me move that over there. We need this A to connect to our roto, like that. And then we can move this back up here. Let's see, does it, there's a way to actually like, oh, there we go. It won't line up with this, but it'll line up with that. That's kind of funny. Um, we'll just move these over a little bit. So now that's a, that can be a nice straight line. These can be a nice straight line as well. Okay. So now these layers are going to merge into this layer. And we need to change the viewer from looking at the roto layer to this screen layer. So we'll select that, hit one. And I don't know what that did. That doesn't look like it actually did anything. Um, let's see. See, this is this is kind of fun. This is a learning experience for myself as well. Ah, there we go. Is that why? That's why, wasn't it? This saber background, make sure that this uh, alpha button is actually on. Because otherwise it's just going to look like this. So let me just make sure. Uh, if check the viewer draws a checkerboard under the image instead of black. Alright, so right there, there's nothing there. Now there's a black layer underneath it. Okay, that looks a lot better. So now we've got our basic lightsaber, and then these points can be moved around and stuff. And this is kind of cool. If I zoom in here, this is something I've never seen before. But see these little these little spokes that stick out from our point? And they highlight uh, green. What these are are individual feather control points, which is kind of different because normally if you go into the roto and you go into the shape, you have the feather. And the feather is how soft the edge of this shape is. And, you know, you can bump that up and it'll come out, you know, looking like that, trying to soften itself up. And uh, we can just set that back to, like, one. And then there's a fall off for it as well, to like how far off it actually disappears and stuff. But what this does is it allows you to click on a point and actually drag out, and you see a, a different um, box appear. Instead of, instead of a traditional curved path, it's now a dotted line. And if I let go of that, what that does is it actually lets me feather an individual spot of this. So this line now from here to there. Now instead of just a sharp edge, it's going to gradually fade off in that direction. Which is pretty cool. And it can be moved around in different directions like that. And then you can bring it back in to the point. It's pretty cool. As as far as I know, I don't think... Oh, there it is. Alright, if you select a point, you can just hit the backspace key. Nope, that's not what I want. That deleted the whole thing. Um, shift E will remove the feather that you've put in that corner. So let's see, Shift E. And that will return that point back to it. Very cool. These are all really good things to know. Like, I'm learning with you guys. And I hope you're all following along easily with this tutorial. Alright, so let's take a look at actually making this into a lightsaber. Now, obviously we've got a black background, and now we've got our center core. And we need to get that connected to this video and obviously line it up so it looks correct. And man, that I don't that video quality looks really bad for some reason. Maybe it's just the preview. Anyway, uh, let's go back to this merge no node. And uh, what we need to do, if we line this up like that, that looks nice and neat is we need to merge this with this merge node. So we need yet another merge node. So if we right click again, go to merge, merges, and we can pick screen again. You can see uh, I had this layer selected, so it automatically linked up as B as the background. And then we can pick A and we can link over here. And 
this says that they don't share the aspect ratio. Uh, let's see, hopefully that doesn't create a problem. Hopefully. Like, I haven't found an option to actually give each of these an individual, um, like a, an individual aspect ratio for itself. I hope that this ends up looking okay. Um, otherwise, I'm just going to have to reformat this uh, video in the correct aspect ratio. Okay, so I found a fix that didn't involve having to re-render the original video out. I found this uh, reformat node, which let me uh, fix it. And uh, now, if I go in here to edit this, now it's actually correctly applied to the image. All right, so let's get started with our actual rotoscoping. Uh, one thing we're going to uh, do is jump into this curve editor right here. And what this does is it allows us to see where our keyframes are. And this is the only real timeline tool that you have within Natron. There's also this thing called Dope Sheet, which I, I don't really know what that does. Uh, I haven't really fooled around with that. But the curve editor is all we really need. It lets us see it. So we can go in here and select this. Um, to make this easier to see, I'm going to disable the rotoscoping itself. So we'll just see the outline. All we have to do in here is just take the opacity and put that at zero for now. So we can just see. This is also um, how you would set it up if you want the saber to suddenly like appear on screen. So let's say it's down here and there's nothing there. The opacity filter would let you go from a frame with zero up to a full frame. And there's not really a, a keyframe for this specific thing. I'm trying to remember what I did to actually create that. Um, let's see. I think what I had to do was uh, right click and choose set a key. So you have to click this add keyframes to it to actually uh, give you the option of there being a uh, keyframe for the opacity. So let's say I want this to be off because it's um, just starting to appear and I'm going to move these points to roughly the area of the saber so let's say I leave a little bit of room on my hands just so I don't hurt myself and this shot this first scene we're not even gonna have the blade visible for this one this is just going to be the initial base layer where there's nothing there and then we'll add the effect afterwards so we just want to line something up kinda of like that Let's see, that looks pretty good. Right about there. Um, that's our initial point um, for our keyframes. And the nice thing about this is this option up in the corner is auto keying. So that's on by default. So anytime you switch a frame and move a key around, or move a point around, it's going to already create a keyframe for that, which is really handy. So in this case it's already created a keyframe and we can go into our curve editor and we see here we've got an animation uh, scale here that shows where our keyframes are and you move this just like you move everything else you move this just like you move anything else in Natron you use your middle mouse button and you can click and drag or zoom in and out to look at this so there is our initial key point, uh, keyframe right there. And all we have to do is move frame by frame through this to change this animation. So to do that, you can simply hit the left and right arrow keys on your keyboard. There are options in here to move uh, frame at a time, which are these little buttons right here but that takes forever why would you don't need to you know keep switching back and forth so just hit right and you can move one frame at a time backwards or forwards so this is the first one there's already a key let's move forward one frame and we can see the blade shifted 
So we're going to just grab the entire mask and just uh, move the whole thing over. So it's going to move like that. And you can see here there's this little animation of it going up like this. And uh, unfortunately for this animation option, they only move in one direction. They're going to keep making this hill that's going to continually climb. And the reason for that is these uh, these points that you see, these keyframes, they're, there's, this is called the curve editor for a reason, because you can add an animation curve to these if you have a space between frames. So you can smooth out the animation and just uh, fix it so maybe in the center of the animation it's a little bit faster, the outside edges maybe it's a little bit slower. It just gives you some control as to how fast and how uh, drastically these keyframes change, whatever uh, you know value they're changing. So with this, since we're pretty much doing everything frame by frame, we're not going to worry about that. Um, this is uh, just two frames here. This is pretty simple. And the nice thing about this is we can cheat a little bit, and we can skip four or five frames with this, because this stays relatively the same as it uh, moves here. It doesn't move a lot. This is pretty simple stuff in the beginning. So let's say instead so we are going to go ahead and cheat a little bit and skip more than one frame which is a really nice feature because it doesn't move a whole lot so instead let's uh, let's go one two three four five let's see how many f uh, exactly what it does five frames apart so obviously we need to zoom in here move the whole thing over and that is pretty good and then we just need to take both of these top points and extend them out past the edge of our image to roughly where the top of this lightsaber blade would be so let's say the top is about there that should be pretty good so now if we go back through we see now we've got these control points through here uh, and there's a gap in between where we don't have keyframes. But what we can do is we can go back and look at each individual one and just see if it lines up correctly with the blade. It should line up pretty well. We might have to put a keyframe here in the middle. Like these top points don't line up quite right. So let's just uh, move these over just a little bit. And the bottom looks okay. And then we can move forward again and again and see just how this looks all the way up to where it, it extends off screen. That looks pretty good. Um, there's just a tiny bit of uh, difference in the bottom from where it originally was. Uh, it moves up slightly. So I'm just going to move this up slightly as well to try to keep that same distance between my hands and the blade and that right there should be pretty good now obviously if we want this to be a little bit faster uh, we can use uh, less frames before we actually have it complete and go out of shot if we want that to be a faster uh, ignition this should be pretty good for what we're doing though and uh, now we can go ahead and go back to, let's see, let's skip a couple frames, see where it actually changes. I have a frame that's coming up um, where it actually starts to blur a little bit. This frame right here is where it starts to change, and then you can't uh, make out the numbers as clearly. So let's try this frame right here and see where that is. And uh, interestingly enough, the top already like lines up really well. Let's uh, match the bottom up, just like this. Might move that up just a tiny bit. You know, depending on just how specific you want to get it, you can make it very, very detailed around here. I'm not going to worry too much about that. Like I think this actually looks pretty good the way it is. Let's see. So. Uh, there that bottom lines up pretty well maybe move this up just a little bit more 
There we go. That looks better. All right, now how does the top line up? We need to go from this keyframe across and across and across. And this one uh, ends up coming back a little bit this way. Right here, there's a difference. It, it It's going in one direction, and then this direction it changes and goes back. Um, so we, we're going to set a keyframe right here. And then move forward this frame and just push this back the way it was. And then uh, this this edge here needs to be brought out a little bit. Alright, so that matches up pretty well. I like that. that. That's looking pretty good. Now that's the basics of rotoscoping. I'm not going to go too much further into this. I'm going to skip actually rotoscoping the rest of it. But I will go far enough into it so you guys can actually see where something starts to get interesting. So let's say this right here. Again, I skipped a couple frames. Should still be able to line it up well and uh, cheat the manual keyframes for every single frame. Line that up on the bottom. And this is where our saber actually starts to blur. And this is uh, this can be a little bit tricky, especially because I'm working on such a light background to actually get the saber in shot correctly. Now, I can still see the initial brown, but then it fades off, and it's kind of hard to tell exactly where the edge is. And that actually works to our advantage in this case, because we always want the trail of the lightsaber. We want it to be just a little bit bigger than the actual blur of the uh, blade for whatever we're swinging around. We want it to be just a little bit bigger to keep it from looking um, just poorly done and from seeing the edges of the original blade. Now obviously with glows and stuff on top it's going to hide quite a bit but we still don't want to have you know edges peeking out. So if we make this just a little bit bigger and we always want to make sure the trailing edge is a little bit longer than the front edge that is in motion the trailing edge should always just lag behind just a little bit further than the front of this. So if, if I back up and uh, we can see from keyframe to keyframe. Now, unfortunately, the animation for this still stays pretty smooth up until this point, and then it starts to jump. So I'm going to have to set a keyframe right here and readjust these points. And fortunately, uh, there's just a little bit of blur. There's not a lot, but it's enough that we're going to want to make sure that these edges all line up correctly. So now we've got a keyframe right here before it actually starts to blur. This one is where it starts to get blurry. And then here's where it is uh, much harder to see. So we can do our best to line this up with what we think should be the edge. And uh, unfortunately, my computer takes forever to uh, re-render this background image as it moves over it. I apologize for that. There's not a whole lot I can do. Ah, now we're getting into much more difficult stuff where it's much harder to see. So it is in here. And unfortunately, this uh, yardstick bends a little bit because it's flat on one side. But that's okay. We can, we can always uh, fix that a little bit later. So, the the trick with this, if you're against a light background, it's hard to make out exactly where the blade is. If you can, try to line it up with the handle. And that's not always easy to do, depending on how your uh, you know camera work is and if you can actually see it. But because the handle is closer to the center, it spins at a slower rate. So, it's not going to be as blurry as the main blade out here. So you can use that as a guide to line this up. So this one, I feel like that's uh, about where it's supposed to be. This doesn't quite look right. It looks like it's supposed to extend further. 
But then judging from what I can see of the brown, that's exactly where it should be. Um, so let's uh, let me just do one more frame of this, and then I'm going to skip ahead to when it's done, so you guys can see just how that looks. So if I just uh, roughly put it there and there, let's see. These points need to come up here a little bit further. And this is a, a lot of trial and error just to get these points all correct. But when you do get them correct, you will you will know because it will look fantastic. So I think that's... Uh, let's do one more just to make sure that everybody actually <laughs> knows what we're doing. Let's attempt to place this here where we think this is going to go. And uh, it's really hard to tell where the brown is up here, but you can see it down here in this uh, white window border. So it goes roughly here. <laughs> and like I said, it doesn't have to be perfect in this case. It's just to show you guys you know, how you would go about doing that. I think this is looking pretty good. Um, I'm not going to change anything more about this. So I finished the basic rotoscoping around the saber. So now it's going to uh, extend out and then it's going to rotate all the way around and back to the original position. So we can just uh, play that forward. These are our play controls here. This is the play forward button. You can also use L on your keyboard and you can use J on your keyboard to play it backwards and then K is to stop. So that's pretty straightforward. So there it is. There's our lightsaber effect as it is. Um, as you can see I turned on uh, I, t I turned the color back to white for our blade and um, something else I wanted to show you is I wanted to show you how um, to actually turn this on and off because we set a, an original frame that didn't have any sort of effects on it which is this frame, the uh, frame 300 and then we move forward a frame and that's where the effect first starts so I wanted to show you uh, how to add that we've got the white blade and what we need to do is add a keyframe to the opacity of our blade so that it will suddenly appear on screen. So to do that uh, we can go into our curve editor. Here we've got the animation curve for the path around our lightsaber. And we need to start at frame 300 and bring up the blade properties. And in here we need to lower the opacity. Uh, make sure that your path is selected down here or else these options won't work. Set this to zero so there is no opacity it's fully transparent then what we need to do is right click and choose set a key it doesn't just give you um, little tick boxes that you would hit to add keys like in After Effects this one you have to manually find the value you want to change which is this and right click and choose set a key uh, then we can hit this add keyframe button here and nothing appears to have changed but if we move forward a frame and we take this opacity and we set it back at a hundred now it gives us this opacity uh, curve editor for uh, some reason it doesn't uh, let you see a keyframe there until you add at least two points so right here so it's off and then it's on and that's going to look pretty good and then it'll obviously continue up and around like our animation shows. That is pretty cool. Now we haven't rounded the tip of this yet and that's just because it's so much easier to work with four points when you're doing your initial rotoscoping than to try to add uh, an additional fifth point that you then have to line up every single shot. And uh, the nice thing about this is, uh, I'll show you, it's pretty cool. If we zoom in here to the end and uh, let's go back to frame 
Like frame one. This is where we want to add the first initial uh, curved point uh, on the lightsaber. So we go back into our curve options here, and we have a tool for adding points to an existing path. And if we select that tool, and then click right here in the middle, it's going to add a point, and this point has control arms on each side of it. Uh, switch back to our selection tool, and we can move this point up. And you can see that I can, I can drag it up and round it out a little bit. And what's even better is that I can use these control arms to extend it on either side if I want a more rounded opening of a saber, such as that. And just uh, you just got to be careful that you don't rotate it, because then it'll end up coming out kind of wonky. But that right there looks pretty good if I just move that t more towards the center. Uh, maybe bring it down just a little bit. That looks pretty good. And the cool thing about this is now that point is going to stay in between those two top uh, path points. And you can see up here at the top that it flattens out. And that's okay. All we have to do is uh, come up here. Let's let this thing actually finish and get to the top of its uh, little point here. All we have to do is go to this point and push it back up and then extend these control arms out on either side once again like so. And now if we go back through and look at these uh, this one, because it's actually got a specific keyframe, it, it is uh, it's stupid, and it doesn't like to save uh, this one right here for some reason. So it's easy though. But uh, just pull that up, extend it a little bit on this side, extend it a little bit on that side. Maybe move it over just a little bit. So now uh, this this one too. Basically, any time that uh, you have a keyframe, now you can go in and edit this point. But it's a lot faster than having to deal with five points each time you switch keyframes initially. At least, that's been my experience. So now, uh, zoom out a little bit so we can see this. So now it's going to go up, and it's going to go to the top here. And for some reason, it keeps flattening this out, which is really strange, because it didn't do that for me the last time that I set up this animation. For whatever reason, it's deciding to do that now. Uh, but yeah, you just, just go through, readjust these points like that, and do that all the way around your saber. Now, obviously, it's out of shot right here, so I'm not going to worry about that. Let's pick a shot where you can actually see the end. Let's go all the way around, um, not through the body. Uh, I'll show you masking for that in a minute. But let's pick this spot right here. And uh, let's just extend this particular node out just a little bit. All right, we're going to grab this and pull it out and just uh, realign this so that it creates more of a, more of a, a nice smooth arc like that, move it forward again, and uh, if if you run into a situation like this, where uh, it jumps from one frame to the next, you need to make sure that this arch doesn't overdo it. So if I say put this out here, and then this frame shows up, this line right here is actually curving and it's going in sort of this direction which doesn't look very good. We want it to line up in this direction with the next swing, the next uh, arch that we have going on. So this this does not work. We need to bring this back in and then just uh, adjust these points once again, kind of like that. And then now it matches the angle that this is moving at. And this one, this one can be kind of like that back around. We don't have to worry about that point. And down and back. And 
And let's see. Here's where our keyframes are. Let's see. I'm not even going to uh, readjust this point here. It's off screen, so it doesn't really matter, and that's the end of our basic animation. But that's how you add a point to it, and also how you add that opacity, uh, like ignition, on the beginning of this. So now, there it's off, and then it's going to go. It's going to go off, and then it's going to go on, and shoot out that way, and then up and around the body. Okay, so our basic blade is done. The only thing left to do is to add the masking and then a glow and color to it, and our saber will be complete. Unfortunately, this video is already long enough, so I'm going to end it there and break it into two parts. The second part will be up tomorrow, May the 5th, uh, which is also called Revenge of the 5th in continuation of Star Wars Day, so be sure to come back tomorrow to watch that. Um, if you haven't already, make sure to subscribe to my channel. And speaking of subscribers, I just passed 3,000 subscribers, and I want to thank you guys so much for supporting my content by subscribing. It really means a lot to me. I appreciate it. Uh, I, it, I mean, I never expected to have 3,000 awesome people watching my videos. So thanks a lot for that. Be sure to come back tomorrow. I'm David Wood for TheBlendMode.com, and may the Force be with you.